Hey everyone, thanks for joining this lecture on the considerations and implications of not securing Web3 technologies. I hope you enjoy the content, it sparks some interest or passion, but most importantly, I hope it makes you think about security in the context of emerging technologies and the future of web platforms. Innovation is just creativity applied with technology. If you've seen one of my lectures or presentations before, you'll be familiar with this quote, but I think it's very important to highlight because Web3 and other emerging technologies are completely enabled by the creativity of the people who work on the projects that will ultimately become the foundation for the next level of widespread technology used by future generations. How's it going? I'm Josh Molly. I'm the National Practice Lead for the Internet of Things and Digital Twins at MODIS, and I work in the spaces of cloud, data, Web3, smart industry, other emerging technologies, and cybersecurity. And today I'm going to be talking about some of the important considerations and implications of not securing Web3 and other emerging technologies. I'm going to start by giving a background into Web1 and Web2. Then I'm going to talk about Web3, the two camps of thought, and generally what I think the future uh, for Web3 holds. And then I'm going to go into some considerations and some implications of not providing sufficient security when building for Web3. But before we can start talking about considerations and implications of securing programming for Web3, let's start with the fundamentals. What is Web1 and 2, also known as the syntactic and the social web? It's important to note here that I'm not going to be catering to the bandwagon and fueling the hype surrounding Web3. This lecture looks at Web3 as a whole and not just the hype around blockchain, um, which is only a small part of Web3, albeit an important one. Further to that point, um, there are two camps of thought effectively on Web3. And I believe they both pay, are a part of a larger picture that I'll be talking about. So if you had hoped that this lecture would just be going on about how great NFTs and cryptocurrencies are, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Now the terms Web1, 2 and 3 were coined by Tim Berners-Lee, widely credited as the founder of the web. Web1 is also referred to as the syntactic web or the read-only web. And this was the early iteration of the World Wide Web that allowed people to search for information and to read it, to consume it. There was not a whole lot of engagement with the web outside of this consumption of information um, and engaging with the web on a deeper level required knowledge of prog programming syntax, which is where the name comes from. An example of this early World Wide Web style is an e-commerce website. Um, and this was really about applying a brick and mortar mindset to the digital realm through the web. People could browse and purchase um, items in a shopping cart, just like a real store, but they couldn't engage or publish content. Web 2 is also known as the read write web or the social web. And this was as a result of the rise of interactive web services, such as email, user groups, blogs, and then ultimately social media. People began to interact and socialize on the web, not just consume information. It's also been used to describe a web dominated by a select few tech giants where majority of web traffic is filtered through these five to eight companies. The final part about big tech is actually one of the primary drivers behind people, especially blockchain enthusiasts, wanting to move towards what they call Web3 or the decentralized web. And this is the second school um, of thought that I'll, I'll be talking about in just a moment. So what is Web3? Because there are many TikToks, many videos, many people talking about it without many really giving a clear definition or description. Usually you'll see a whole bunch of buzzwords like blockchain, cryptocurrency, NFT, decentralization, but there won't be any, in, uh, any description or realistic outlook on how we can achieve a decentralized web and what implications arise as a result of it. But before we go down the blockchain web three rabbit hole, it's important to talk about the original web three, which was the semantic web. The semantic web was a term described by Tim Bernsley in 1999, and it was first described as Web3 in 2006. And it describes a web where computers and artificial intelligence was capable of analyzing all of the data on the web and intelligent agents would be able to interact with people. This artificial intelligence and human, human computer interface is the first school of thought around Web3. Now, when we talk about these two different camps, I believe they're both describing components of the same thing just different sides of the blockchain hype table. Web3 is described by blockchain enthusiasts is a term coined in 2017 by Gavin Wood, the co-founder of Ethereum. And it's typically used to describe a decentralized web that moves away from big tech. Um, the term is very popular in blockchain financial circles like cryptocurrencies, NFTs, DAOs, etc. 
Most of the criticism of the two definitions of Web3 target this utopian hype of either a fully decentralized internet running on blockchain or the idea of a fully machine passable web. For example, Musk and Dorsey dismissed the blockchain Web3 as buzzwords and venture capitalist playthings. They highlight the, the volatile nature of the technologies whose value is almost entirely based on public opinion. Whereas critics of the semantic web over the two decades it's been around have mainly commented on the feasibility of formalizing knowledge in a machine passable and interpretable manner. Many of these criticisms were made before the recent advancements in artificial intelligence though. I believe both of the, the two schools will be components of the actual Web3. Um, and I believe Web3 is inevitable, but in the same way, there are still Web1 websites now, there's still Web2 websites very much alive. I believe there'll still be Web1 and 2 sites when Web3 does fully come around. So I wouldn't be able to criticize people for fluffing around the definition without actually providing one myself. So here is my prediction and definition of Web3. A web that allows interactivity through virtual and mixed reality where intelligent agents and AI can not only find, interpret and communicate information, but also create interactions with the web will embrace mixed or virtual reality such as the metaverse and will be enabled by the internet of things where smart devices will provide feedback, input, output and facilitate the seamless interface with our real world environment. And decentralized currencies, artifacts, and organizations will democratize parts of our web experience, bringing some of the power back into the hands of the users. But all this presents a problem, right? I gave a presentation last year talking about the security implications of the Internet of Things, and I mentioned things like pacemakers being hackable. But when we consider all the things Web3 will bring, it's an even scarier thought. If all of your finances are in crypto and you suffer a 51% attack, if your metaverse tactile feedback suit gets hacked uh, and crushes your vitals, if you stole all your private keys on a USB, it makes being robbed a lot scarier. You know, it's tough to lug out a, a valuable TV or large electronic, but malicious uh, actors can begin targeting USB dev um, devices, much smaller, more mobile. So what are some of the things that we can do as security professionals um, and that we need to consider when preparing for jobs in Web3? So first I wanna share some considerations and cautionary tales that we're facing um, before providing some suggestions um, for, for developing security mechanisms in Web3. So authorize, um, authentication and authority is a big problem. Most decentralized applications known as dApps today don't actually authenticate or sign their API responses. And I think that speaks for itself. If you're building Web3 apps, basic things like API authentication must be included. Imagine a decentralized bank app that doesn't do API authentication or response signing. Um, so it's important for us as security professionals to push for basic security standards to be included in Web3. Furthermore, a lot of dApps claiming to be Web3 applications currently use centralized services like Infura or Alchemy. Moxie Marlinspike, the creator of Signal and the co-author of the Signal Protocol, documents th th uh, these issues with Web3 on his blog, where he identified that dApps themselves typically aren't distributed, they're just React websites. Um, but the decentralized part then they claim is the state and permissions which lie on a blockchain instead of a centralized database. But he goes on to point out that OpenSea, the largest NFT marketplace, removed an NFT that he created, bringing light to the issue that even though um, even NFTs, which one of the shining stars of Web3 blockchain world, are controlled by Web2 companies. The company can just pull off an NFT um, without having to justify it, they still have that control of a Web2 company. So how can we remove this centralized control points um, when even Web3 apps typically uh, naturally gravitate towards this kind of model? And finally, a common factor of many blockchain technologies is user-controlled cryptographic key management. So you have a private key for your wallet, application, authentication server, and losing this key or losing possession of this key uh, is devastating. So many people, um, so many people use platforms, Web2 platforms, um, such as Coinbase, to act as a custodian or an intermediary um, to manage your private keys and wallets for you. Like I said, I don't think we'll ever fully go to a decentralized web, but a consideration for security experts in Web3 will be the management of many different cryptographic keys without relying on these centralized organizations, if that's what you're going for. A big differ differentiator of blockchain is its security um, applied in a decentralized nature. But this decentralized security comes at the cost in terms of energy and sustainability. 
To prove the correctness of data and transactions, blockchains can use a number of different proof of functions. Two of the big ones are proof of work, where miners compete to solve complex equations and are rewarded by the faster solver getting uh, the right to add new transactions to the blockchain. And then there's proof of stake, which a validator stakes a certain value of their own crypto as collateral. Uh, the, val uh, the validator is rewarded with the right to create the next um, block in the blockchain and maintain the public ledger in proportion to their stake in the network. So proof of work is much more secure and it's more time hardened. It's been around and tested for longer but it's significantly more expensive for energy consumption. Um, the Ethereum blockchain is actually moving away from proof of work to proof of stake and has stated that they expect to see a 99% reduction in energy usage. In fact, Bitcoin, which uses proof of work, accounts for 0.6% of all the energy usage in the world, um, a stat from July last year. So this one crypto, Bitcoin, uses 0.6 of all the energy in the world. I think it was... Um, if it was a country, it would be in the top 30 highest consuming countries of energy in the world, which is insane. So another consideration for Web3 utilizing blockchain technologies is the balance between security and sustainability. We also have to remind Web3 developers that cryptographic techniques doesn't automatically mean security. Having information on public blockchains doesn't mean that no information is to be uh, encrypted, private and secured. Yes, I can go to Hotspotty on the Helium network and see beacon witnesses, challenges, and mining rewards for a Helium hotspot, but I shouldn't and can't see the full name, address, phone number, email, etc. for the owner of that hotspot. Some information can be public, some should be private. The second internet is full of people making the move to Web3, and while I enthusiastically encourage everyone, technical or otherwise, to upskill in technology and to learn one of the many forms of development, because many Web3 developers are hobbyists, hackathon participants, or young keen entrepreneurs who just want to go to market, the focus on security by design is vacant. It's a very tough thing to do, but we need to develop some baseline security requirements for all these emerging blockchain technologies. With the democratization of data and shifting data ownership from centralized platforms into the hands of the user, education is more important than ever. And there are currently many restrictions in place that act as a safety net for people to protect them against um, malicious actors, but also accidents. But what about in a world where your metaverse avatar and your username is your identity and spoofing can result in simple, automatable and large scale identity theft and impersonation? Or what about a world where the loss of a cryptographic key on a USB can mean the loss of your life savings? or a world where social media information is machine readable and interpretable by AI models, it's vital that we continue to educate the, uh, the public on how to stay safe, secure, and adapt to these new advances. Because the impacts of failure are far greater without these safety nets. The reality of a decentralized world is a lack of safety and regulation. We've seen kids order dozens of pizzas with their parents' credit card, but what about a kid maxing out a, a credit card on a crypto that gets rug pulled? NFT scams, enticing people to get rich quick schemes, um, Tinder swindlers dating multiple people around the world in the metaverse. And let's talk about bio-integrated technologies. I don't actually know the word to describe technologies like the biometric circuit tattoos, um, implants or other biometric interfacing devices. So I'm just gonna call them bio-integrated technologies here. Um, as we see more and more of these technologies that are integrated with our bodies and technologies that allow us to interact with mixed and virtual reality, we must ensure that they are secured. Because art imitates life. With deep fakes, um, generative adversarial networks, uh, smart chatbots, you could completely fabricate a person and have a chatbot imitating a person for mass fraud and scamming. Imagine the Tinder swindler um, where it's an AI on the other side, not a person. The scale of fraud artificial intelligence could provide is significant. And finally, how do we have accountability in a decentralized world? The recent Log4j vulnerability teaches us an important lesson on accountability and the implications for a decentralized future. Decentralized projects may mean there is no dedicated accountability. And without accountability, we need to start thinking about guarantees that we can substitute in to ensure issues are disincentivized. So I just bombarded you with a ton of information, facetious comments and a slight tad of sarcasm. But what helpful suggestions can I give you to go out into the future of Web3 in a secure manner? So I've got some suggestions um, that you can follow to, to securely develop 
and, um, and work in a web-free world. Design with ethical practices in mind, and this is hugely important when designing machine interpretable data on people. Um, so shameless self-plug here, but you can read my article on the ethics of computer vision for a starting point um, into the whole ethics of, of artificial intelligence and the applications. Um, detecting fraud and ending it um, is, is something that should be baked into your platforms. So scams, unethical use of your platform, all that stuff, you should bake in the ability to detect and to end. Um, that way people can't use your platform, Facebook, um, as, a, as a mechanism to, to wide scale scam people. Um, many Web2 security practices still do apply in Web3. So generally you should adopt existing security principles by default and remove them if they don't work rather than starting with nothing and only trying to adopt ones you think will do work, adopt them by default. Consider whether decentralizing an app is, at, is necessary or realistic and what the implications um, on security if it is done. Consider the sustainability impact of applications and whether the heightened security is necessary. So an example of that is the proof of stake migration with Ethereum. Classify your data, what should be public and what should be private. Encourage developers to design with security in mind. Remind them the cost of failure for security on Web3, such as the Poly Network Act. Educate your peers and, and your network and encourage your mindset of learning and questioning. That's important. And the more dangerous it is to somebody's health, so it's physical or mental um, health, the more it should be secured. And that's the end of my lecture. Here are the slide credits for the deck that has become my staple. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you got some value. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. My Medium um, has the article on ethical considerations of computer vision, and we'll be getting a new post about every three weeks. My YouTube doesn't um, have enough views for a custom URL, but you can search Josh Morley IoT and you'll see the profile picture that looks like that. Um, and there are other, other lectures and presentations that I've given on there. And I don't use Twitter that much, but feel free to follow me there. Thank you very much.